Welcome to our webinar today. I'm Dr. Gloria Horsley with Dr. Heidi Horsley and with Mary Fetchett. Mary's the founding director of the Voices of September 11th. And we are very excited about this show today. And it is uh, also brought to you with the Compassionate Friends. Welcome, uh, Heidi and Mary. Hi, Mom. Hi. Hi, there. Hi Mary. So great to be able to do this show together because uh, handling the holidays is really important. Well, my uh, name is Mary Fetchin, and I lost my 24-year-old son Brad on 9/11. He was on the 89th floor of Tower Two, and he was the oldest of our three sons. Our son Wes was 20 at the time, and in college, and we had a 13-year-old um, Chris who was in middle school. And I was a clinical social worker at the time, so my natural reaction was to start going into New York City, and I started holding weekly meetings in my home in Connecticut for the Connecticut families, and uh, that was really the beginning of the organization. So uh, today we, we've provided over 100,000 hours of support services. Uh, we've worked with the families to commemorate their loved ones' lives, and we've collected 70,000 photographs that we, we have on our website, but we've also gifted to the museum in New York City. And then uh, also we're working uh, with other communities that are impacted by other tragedies, trying to share our lessons learned to help help them heal. Great. That's great. And Heidi, I know you worked with the 9-11 families also, right? I did, and I so want commemorate Mary because I mean here she has done so much amazing work in giving over a hundred thousand hours of support services and reaching so many families impacted by 9-11 and yet she also had a personal experience losing her son in 9-11 mm -hmm. and you know just to have both of those experiences I mean it's it's a lot and she has done amazing things 9-11 was such a profound uh, impact not just on our families but on the country and the world at large. You know, I, I really recognized immediately after that there were were going to be long-term needs uh, for the families that were impacted, and of course it goes beyond our families, but the people that survived, and now the rescue workers and and responders who are so sick and dying um, from complications of working down there. Um, so when you lose somebody. Um, in a traumatic <clears throat> event like that, it, it puts you into another category because you're not just dealing with a loss, which is, you know, incredible to begin with, but you're also uh, faced with navigating very complicated systems, um, you know, everything from, you know, investigations that may occur um, just the public nature of the event, a trial, potentially a, a trial, and you know, just a long list of um, issues that impact that grief. Yes, and, and it can certainly be individuals that have a traumatic loss where people are murdered. And, and I noticed, I know you were saying that your son was a bit uh, feeling like something could happen again. You know, I think there's that internal feeling uh, maybe some danger uh, and which has n nothing to do with the holidays but you know impacts that and I guess it does have to do with the holidays because I think there's a stress factor one of the things that I wanted to mention too and and remember is that not everybody who has had a traumatic loss is going to grieve exactly the same we all grieve differently but also there's the impact whether it happened one year ago two years ago three years ago um, you have lived through some hard because I've got a lot of clients right now that have losses and come to me because I have a private practice and you know they feel very overwhelmed about what's going on in the world and and sometimes they feel so overwhelmed that they feel like you know what I'm having a hard time functioning and I, I when I, I validate and acknowledge that there is a lot going on in the world and there's a lot of tragedy however there's also a lot of very amazing people in this world and a lot of people like Mary that are out there changing the world and doing incredible things out there. So we need to also balance the tragedy in our heads with the, the love and the positive and the hope because otherwise we're, we're going to become incapacitated. 
with it all and overwhelmed. Well, as we say on this, the impact of loss, uh, it affects holiday traditions. Really, I wanted to put to, together sort of a list of things for people to think about if it's their first holiday. Um, certainly, the, uh, you know, under any circumstances, the holidays can be stressful. Um, but after you've suffered a, a loss of a loved one, you know, I, I think the um, the the challenges, but also the opportunities you have, are to really take um, uh, advantage of those gathering with family and friends. But I do think that you have to set your own, you know, rules. Uh, one thing I also want you to, to take into consideration is every one individual in your family is going to go through this differently. Mm -hmm. So I think to think about what you can do versus what you can't do and take small steps. So gatherings with friends and family, you know, when you're in, at a, uh, large parties and so forth, maybe that's not the best place for you to be. But maybe you can gather with friends that are going to be supportive. Um, Taking into consideration family rituals, I, I know for myself, Christmas was um, always one of my fa favorite holidays, and I, I loved um, buying the, the children uh, Christmas ornaments, that, and I loved putting them up every year. Um, but after the loss of bread, that was very difficult for me. And so we had to find, you know, what can we do as a family? We had two other children. So we did put up a tree, but um, it was really my husband that stepped in and started uh, taking on some of the responsibilities I had and decorating the house and so forth. I had a dear friend that, um, you know, one night we heard it tapping at the, you know, on the side of the house, and they had come and they had hung up a wreath. Um, I, I reached out to other family members to think, to talk with them about things that they did. Some people put up a tree and they put one ornament on it the first year, but then they saw that evolve over time. Um, they also, gift giving was a challenge for me. Um, my sons are built very differently. And so, you know, when, typically when I would go shopping, I'd see something that, you know, Brad had very broad shoulders. So, uh, you know, I could um, select things for him and select things for my other son. And just to be in the men's department doing that, I, it was just too many family members uh, did continue some of, of the rituals and the traditions that they had. And they felt that their loved one would want them to continue on. So they kept some of those traditions about, you know, reading the night before Christmas and gathering with other family members to talk about their daughter. Uh, they also um, did things in memory of them. So, uh, and I remember those early years too. I thought, well, Brad's not here, but I could buy something for another um, child that might be less um, privileged uh, and buy that in Brad's memory. Uh, one year mm -hmm. we, we went and worked on the midnight run where we uh, delivered food and clothing uh, to the homeless in New York City. Oh, nice. So finding some things that you can do in memory of the person um, that's not bringing the, <laughs> you know, the memories uh, of the person back, but doing something to honor their life if, 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 if it's too difficult um, to be sorting through uh, decorations and so forth. Somebody um, was uh, telling us about going, they take their daughter shopping for, um, she's actually, it was her brother that died, and she takes her daughter with her, and they go around and buy a gift that they think he would like, and then they give it to uh, Toys for Tots. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely, and and many people. I know we we've, we've actually uh, encouraged people to do those kinds of things. Um, I also one way that we changed uh, our traditions is um, we were very fortunate to have uh, very good friends that invited us over to their house for Thanksgiving and Christmas, and I think it was um, the fifth year. <laughs> my children said, you know, Mom, we'd really like to have the holidays at our house this year. So 
So I, they were encouraging me, but and also my friends were, so they came to our house on the fifth year. So you really have to be able to accept those um, kind gestures and acts of kindness. As you were saying, uh, Heidi, there's wonderful people out there. And certainly uh, in the early years, it was really my, my friends and the community. Um, but that evolved to, uh, to be friends that I didn't know on, until 9-11 that were part of the 9-11 community. And, um, and then, of course, uh, we supported one another, too, through those challenging times. Then your husband stepped in to do things and other people stepped in because, like you mentioned for yourself, it wasn't an option for you to pull the covers over your head because you still had two children. You still had sons, two sons that you needed to do some of the holiday stuff for. Well, and most people that had children or, or truthfully, even animals have forced them to get up and out of bed. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the days following uh, their loss, really were the ones that you know gave them that continued meaning to life, and and that's really important when you go through a loss uh, to be living for the living, to remember the person that died and honor that memory, but to be there for the people that survived. Mm -hmm. We've got we've got a question here. Or And he was 22 years old. Christmas is so hard to think about without him here. So how can our family celebrate without forgetting him? Uh, one of the family members that uh, uh, wrote me did talk about having the empty chair. And if, if the table was too crowded, they put, you know, a little uh, card, you know, and at their seat. So... Uh, I, I think that they have to really decide uh, what they can do. It, it is hard, and the challenging part is it's something that you have to work through. But I think to understand um, how your family can support each other and what you can do and what you can't do, to think of new ways that you can uh, move forward. Some families go out of town. Um, and they go to a place that's already decorated, so so they are celebrating Christmas or the holidays on some level, but they're not doing all the work related to it. One thing, we actually put a picture there, right, Hyde? Absolutely. I mean, like Mary said, we've got to, I don't know these people, but whatever they can handle. And for us, I liked having a picture of Scott at the table. He had a place, and there was a picture, and that brought comfort to me. And, you know, if that's comforting comforting to them and the other thing that I've heard people do is like getting a wreath and then putting things on the wreath that represent your child that died for example my brother was a New York Jets fan so we would put Jets stuff up on that wreath he loved Twix bars he loved cinnamon gum I mean putting things up on that wreath that represented that person and hanging the wreath if that's if they feel that they could do that the, the other thing I like is uh, giving a toast but asking mm -hmm. somebody that you know is going to be at a dinner or whatever, if they would give a toast to your child and say their name, we love to hear their name. When I work with siblings, and I work with brief siblings a lot, and uh, what, what I hear over and over is we love hearing our brothers and sisters' names and we love having toasts, but we, we would like if we were also included. So in other words, for our family, you know, Scott was the one, my brother was the one that died, saying, this is for Scott. We're so, this is in memory of him and to celebrate his life tonight, he's our, our guiding light and it's also for, for a toast for my three daughters, Heather, Rebecca, and Heidi, and they, we're so glad to have them all in our lives together. So kind of more of an all-inclusive, including the other kids that are there. We, we also set up, a, 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 might sound funny, uh, but a Christmas tree at the grave mm -hmm. site. And we all oh, I love that, Brad, Mary. Brad's favorite. Um, and I actually got lights that um, had batteries, so we even uh -huh. had the lights on. And um, I, I know other families that have um, uh, decorated, I think it's called like a, a grave wreath or um, where they put, as you said, Heidi, things that were 
um, that the person that they lost enjoyed. Mm -hmm. I oh, love yeah. that idea of the Christmas the tree. I think that's great. That's sweet. Or a menorah. Uh, here's another question. What do you do about family members that think you should be over the death by now? That'd probably be starting with the second year. I mean, you can't even go past one Christmas. After one well, Christmas is gone, you're supposed to be, you know, back with it, well, right? I, I want to say something about that because my brother's been dead over 30 years. And, and I feel really strongly about this. I will never get over Scott. I don't want to get over him. I am the person I am today because he was in my life. However, I am no longer in that intense pain I was once in. So while he's always, I'll never be over him, I'm over that intense pain and I have a, I'm in a place of hope again. Uh, I um, disconnected from, from anyone that was negative and mm -hmm. surrounded myself uh, with supportive people. And, um, you know, you realize when you lose someone that's, you know, very important in your life, how short life is. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, I would make it clear with that person, as Heidi said, that you'll never be over them. There will always be a hole in your heart that will never be filled, but in some uh, way they become part of you, part of who you are, and part of your day, and, and they're always with you in a different way than they are when, when they're alive. So, you know, I, I was pretty straightforward with people that felt I should be over it, and, um, and I would have to say I would distance myself from those people. When you're going through a loss, you really need to be with people that are there to support you. Mm -hmm. here's, an, here's another question. Um, what would you advise about multiple losses at the same time? My daughter, son-in-law, and six grandchildren were murdered. Oh, oh my, my goodness. goodness. That's so daughter, son-in-law, and six grandchildren were murdered August of 2015. It is now just myself a single grandparent and my 15-year-old granddaughter who I am raising. That was only August of this year. Oh my gosh. Oh my That's God. incredible. I, I hope that you're getting support and I hope you're going to the Compassionate Friends meeting because and probably parents of murdered children. I think there are organizations that you really would need to get support from. I'm, I'm really thinking that to start with. Well, I read something about multiple losses like this all at once. And Mary can weigh on this too because I know this is her expertise as well. And and this woman had, had lost her whole family. And what she said, and like everything is it's different depending on the person, but what she found to be helpful was going to a grief expert every single, as a couple times a week at the beginning, as much as she needed it at the beginning, going to a support group and doing restorative yoga a couple times a week. I mean, she found that combination and said here it's different for everybody but support is so key this person my heart goes out to you this grandmother this is an amazing a really big big amount of loss you don't want to do this alone because sometimes when we're isolated and alone we think we're going crazy and that something's wrong with us when the reality is what we're doing most of the time is fairly normal given that kind of loss first of all you know my condolences I, I just can't imagine what that would be like um, mm -hmm. Uh, so my heart goes out to you, uh, but I would agree with Heidi. You're 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 going to want to create. Uh, you have a small family now. Or are there ways that you you can extend your family through your um, through your friends or your community or your church um, to be part of a community? Um, so you're not facing this alone. You know, I know people after 9-11 that had lost several people and, you know, one person got, uh, they got very involved in um, things that those individuals liked and, and in an odd sort of way that expanded their vision of the world uh, through the memory of the person uh, that they lost. I think it is absolutely amazing that she is on this webinar. This is very mm -hmm. recent. She is really, you know, here trying to get support for herself and for her granddaughter. And I give her so much credit for that. Yeah, let others support you. I think this is important. I want to say that sometimes you need to teach people to do this. So I think not only the people that are watching this webinar, but 
who want to help friends, but also people who are watching it that have had a loss. Sometimes you're going to have to help people learn how to listen to you. Well, I was always a very independent person, and so it was hard for me to ask people to help me. And so I found it was really important, um, you know, after the loss and certainly the people on the call, um, the first thing that you want to be with people that are can listen. And, um, you know, and, and, and listening uh, isn't passive. It's a, an act of, for people to really listen, they're active, engaged. They're not trying to solve your problem. Um, they're not trying to necessarily give advice. In the early stages, you just need someone that's there for you. And, you know, it could be a friend, it could be a pastor, it could be a clinician um, that's really meeting you where you are in those, those early days. I think the constant relationship with friends that are there um, without being asked to be there. Um, it's really important to be with people that are able to anticipate your needs. I remember after 9-11, uh, someone showing up and, you know, raking our lace. Uh, as I mentioned, a friend putting a wreath on um, the side of the house. Uh, people calling and saying, you know, it has to be, um, it can't be complicated. They have to draw, you know, if they drop off food or they um, call and say, I'd like to take you to lunch, can you um, go out today or tomorrow? <laughs> now, when can you go out? That's too complex when you're um, going through a loss. You really need people that um, can anticipate what you need. If you need your children need a ride to their baseball game. Um, mm -hmm. Or to go and, Christmas shopping. Or, or to go Christmas shopping. I mean, I needed help. I, I could shop, but I couldn't drive, you know, when I had to buy an outfit, you know, for Brad's funeral. Um, mm -hmm. You know, whoever, what mother ever thinks about, and you can associate with this, glory about buying uh, something to wear for your son's funeral. Right. I was planning on his wedding, not his funeral. Um, picking out the headstone, planning the memorial mass. Um, you know, you need people that um, can bring their expertise and, and whatever support that they can give you and, and do it without being asked. Yeah. Uh, after Scott died, I was 20 and Scott was 17, but, you know, an, an ex-boyfriend who I'd broken up with came and said, what can I do for your family? He said, my, my girlfriend lost her twin brother, and she said, they need you to go in and support them right now. And he was amazing. He ran, ran around and helped us get my, you know, photographs of my brother and helped us do all these errands for the funeral. And like you said, Mary, I, I never thought I'd be getting photographs of my brother collecting them for his funeral. So, you know, we needed somebody that, and driving, I didn't want to drive. You know, I just was a, a, not in a good space. So we, you need people to do these kind of things. And, you know, one of the things that one of my 9-11 families said that they loved is that, People, their neighbors would constantly plow their driveway or shovel their driveway when it was snowing out. I mean, something like that is really invaluable when you're grieving. We've got, a, we've got another question here that's related to the holidays and, and uh, related to music, which I know can be hard. She said, we lost our son in July of 2015 in a tragic car accident. We find it very hard to listen to Christmas songs. How do you handle that? Oh my gosh, the worst thing for me after Scott died was going to church and hearing music. It just was devastating. Being out of sync with what's going on, you know, the festive music and and um, when you're feeling very sad, the, you know, social gatherings, um, you know, the, the um, people talking about things that, in your view, at that point are not that important. Um, you know, life continuing on for other people and feeling like you're um, stuck in uh, slow motion. So I think you just, I remember I, I would, I would, I love music and I would listen to Andre Bocelli was one of Brad's favorite. In fact, we um, played that at his funeral, uh, one of his songs. 
and I, I would listen to sad music so I could cry. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it was very hard to listen because it was more in sync with how I was feeling versus festive music where I was feeling disconnected. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think the hard thing about Christmas music, I mean, is that nowadays you go into malls and you go into you know any place and it's piped in. You can go to the supermarket and there's Christmas music that's piped in, so it, you don't have control over when you're going to hear it. And I think that can be really hard when you're out running errands and you're constantly hearing it. First year is tough. It's tough. All you can do is just kind of trudge through it and try to get help and support. You're kind of frozen, and it's it's a very you know difficult uh, year to just put one foot in front of the other and uh, try to keep well, some perspective. And I don't know this person's situation, but if they're really concerned about music and being out and having Christmas music all of a sudden come on, they might have put a headset on and listen to a book on tape. I know that sounds weird. Or, or, mm-hmm. or listen to their music that they've chosen just if they have to do that, you know, because you're kind of in survival mode early on. Yeah, so whatever's going to work. And, you know, remember when you, um, early on, you need to tell people that, if you're not going to come to a party, you don't want to do it, you need to tell them siblings want to do or their children want to do some of these things. Make sure that they have somebody else to take them and bring them home so they can go to the events that you are maybe difficult for you. And also make sure you always have a ride home and uh, so that you can leave so you're not caught in some situation where you have to where you have to stay. But also, I always like to tell people, if you're going to holiday events, also tell the people at the event or the you know hostess or whatever that if you need a moment, you may have to leave the table or whatever. Don't come and get me. I'll be back. You know, so people uh, aren't don't give you that time that you have to have sometimes. Gloria, I, I wonder if I could mention something else about that because. Um, one of the challenges, I think, uh, for families are sometimes people don't invite you because they feel like you're mourning or you f- they feel like you wouldn't want to come. And um, uh, and so um, I, I remember birthdays, graduations, um, christenings, you know, all of those things are hard uh, for me when I had losing a child. Uh, where you would see people their age um, growing up and their you know their their marriages and their children and so forth because it's all of what would have been for you mm-hmm. and and the expect expectations you had for their life. So what I tried to do is that um, maybe I would go for a shorter period of time as you say, have a ride home. So maybe I wouldn't go to the wedding, but I'd go to the reception, or maybe I'd go to the um, wouldn't go to the graduation, but I'd go to the party after, um, and be able to leave and, and take it in small steps uh, and focus on what you can do um, and, and try to build that up over time. I agree. I like that. Well, um, I wanted to, we're talking about commitment rating your loved one, and we have a couple of comments here that, uh, some ideas of what uh, people are thinking. Uh, one said, because the person that died was part of those warm memories, celebrate that. The beloved deceased, per, uh, deceased person taught you how to love in a particular way. Uh, concentrate on that. They taught you about life because they died. That is their legacy honor and Pay attention to this. I like what was said about a wreath with her favorite things on it. And then a person, uh, another person says, we did our Christmas tree in all blue, his favorite color, Karen. My dad passed suddenly at the end of September, and while we made it through Thanksgiving, Christmas is a different animal. I'm most concerned for my mom. Any advice about comforting spouses as it's a much different relationship than him as my father? Positive positivity is my best medicine, but it's easier said than done. Siblings are always worried about their parents, so there's some kind of mm-hmm. a, you know, a, an order here. Well, I think that it's. It, I think the hardest thing is to watch someone that you love. I mean, I, it was very hard for me to watch yeah. my parents in pain, and I think I think what we're what we said earlier, acknowledging and validating how hard it is, and support just being with people and listening. The hard part is we want to fix it, 
And we all know at the end of the day, you really can't fix this because if you were going to fix that pain early on for me, you would have to go get Scott and bring him into the room and he'd have to be alive. Um, so being there in the moment with somebody and just maybe telling positive, listening to positive stories, reminiscing about positive things that have happened in the past can sometimes be helpful. And just being, being with them because, you know, early on, when people have, have had a loss and they're grieving, often people run the other way because they don't want to tolerate being around that kind of emotion and pain. You know, it depends upon the individual. So mm -hmm. uh, it could be that, you know, uh, asking your mother, you know, about her life with your dad or looking at mm -hmm. putting together a photo album, uh, maybe writing stories about him. Uh, maybe she enjoys going out and being with other people. So I think you really have to take her lead and support her and whatever it is that's comforting to her. And and getting and if she wants to do this, um, like I said, I don't know her situation. Get maybe she wants to be involved in, in some kind of a widow support organization or group, mm -hmm. so, so that she can get support from other people that have had the same a similar loss. I I think one thing we have to remember is he died in September suddenly. Mm -hmm. She is going to really be sad. very sad. Yeah, and that, I think true. that's hard for us to deal with as human beings. That we have a person that we love very much who is very sad. Mm-hmm. Well, and, I, and they spent so many, so many years together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and like and you I, said, Mary, she may want to reminisce about her life. It would be interesting to ask her about what was it like before I was born with Dad. Tell me more about your relationship. You know, because our parents have a whole history before we came along that oftentimes we've never explored with them. Mm-hmm. And, and I think uh, I like your idea, Mary, of having her do something active too, and and having other family members do something active. Um, you know, maybe a little memorial table. Um, what we do is we put a, a rose in a vase for Scott uh, during the special occasions and the holidays. So there are things that you could find out what she would like. Would you like something put out for Dad? And also, you know, as I say, toasting him, honoring him, um, maybe you know, having people write down positive memories about him. Writing down a, a, or a funny memory. Yeah, Talks funny, about a funny story yeah. that, that happened. Yeah. But uh, but taking that active active role and seeing what she wants to do. But it will be difficult. And it was her dad that died too. So it's going to be a difficult holiday, no question. Mm -hmm. Things do get better though. And here are some ideas you've got here. Light a memorial candle. Share stories. I think you've got a lot of them here. Uh, we've got a lot here of things that you can do to help her. Here's another one. I had a lot of trouble going to the uh, grocery store and doing Christmas food shopping. What do you think about that? Is that unusual? I would say it, it's typical. You know, people. Um, I would say when you're when you're grieving. You know, everything changes, your your emotional state, your energy level. And, and you know, the holidays takes a lot of energy. Um, grocery shopping and cooking in particular for your family. And so I would say, you know, maybe to do something different and, and go out to dinner. Or, mm -hmm. you know, as we did, go to a friend's house for dinner and maybe bring a small dish but not be responsible for the whole di whole dinner. Uh, lighting memorial candles, that's great. Do you have a candle lighting for nine, uh, for the 9-11 families, Mary? Uh, we do. I, I actually, uh, you know, I was a clinician before 9-11, and we had um, a candle lighting ceremony. In fact, the photograph up at the top of the picture, those are September 11th candles, and every year mm -hmm. we added another candle and so each candle is a memory of something um, and so I find um, lighting a candle too there's a presence in the room so any ceremony that we would have that was the first thing that we did was light the candle to represent the presence of the people uh, with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, those random acts of, acts of kindness. One day I was leaving to actually go visit 
someone that had died in a family that had had a loss in 9-11 and I was going on West Side Highway to get out of the city and I was at the toll booth and the, and the toll booth operator said, the person in front of you just paid your toll in memory of his daughter. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And I said, I want to pay the guy behind me toll, you know, his toll in memory of my brother. And I was laughing because the toll booth operator looked at me and he probably thought everybody around him was dying, but it was, it made me feel really good. And, you know, so I think paying it forward also makes you, it just makes you feel really good because when we shift our grief into, into service, I think we begin, we begin to heal. At least I did. Mm -hmm. Well, and I can say for the 9-11 families, um, there were hundreds of families started foundations that, um, you know, benefited other people in memory of the person that was lost. So there were scholarships that were created for underprivileged children. Um, there were, um, you know, science labs built, um, book pack. Uh, I remember the Jackman family um, collects book packs and puts in pencils and books for children, um, you know, underprivileged children. Uh, there's so much need out. You know, and you don't have to go far to look for people that need help. So I think it uh, depends upon, and in most cases, these individuals, it was something that their loved one, um, it was honoring his life, um, whether it was through the school that they went to and a, a scholarship that was created there, or something that was important to them. Nice. Uh, we've got another question here. It says, before you end the show, could you talk about some ideas to take care of myself physically? I am very worried about my health. Wow. That is, that's a good comment because people don't realize what a stress grief is on your health. Mm-hmm. Um, Heidi and I have, have done some things talking about gratitude. There are actually some things that you can do that, that can change your physiology when you've had a loss. And one of them, believe it or not, is expressing gratitude. Right, Heidi? Absolutely, yes. Um, that's one of the biggest ways you can shift your energy quickly is just to think about, I mean, and it's hard early on with the loss, you know, and, you know, what, what can we be grateful for still on this earth? Um, even though our loved ones are no longer here. Um, and it sounds like this person also has some health things you said, Mom, that they're they're worried about their health. You know, I, and, I, and I keep coming back to this, but the research supports it over and over and over. I've read so much research right now about this restorative yoga. Restorative yoga is, is nothing but, but kind of lying. I mean, if you go to a restorative yo yoga class, you don't feel like you're working out. It, they move you in different places. You're on the floor a, with a pillow. And they're moving your body in different places in a very passive way, but it's, it's moving your energy and changing the way that you feel. And there's a lot of research that says that this is a really positive, you know, way to work out for people that are grieving. And like I said, it doesn't feel like a workout. Walking is another one, Mom. You've talked about that on this show. Yeah, you can reduce your risk of stroke by 50% by walking only 20 minutes a day, according to yeah. the research. And you can walk slowly. And at first, maybe you'll have to do five minutes. Like Mary said, work up to those places. Yeah, but I, I would you... say um, I, I would agree with you with with yoga and the walking or running, uh, whatever it is, you, activity that you like, um, or starting a new activity that you wish that you had taken up. But also meditation. Mm -hmm. And um, I know I went to Joan London's um, women's camp, and that that was just terrific because it was all women. And they had all kinds of uh, classes that were going on throughout the day. Uh, it also was an opportunity for women to talk. And um, and there are camps and activities like that that you can participate in. Mm -hmm. And there's there's some simple things to do, like uh, weirdly enough, to change your energy. You can s snap your fingers both sides 50 times, and it will actually change your energy level. You can ra just raise your arms over your head, and it will actually change your energy level. How do you talk about smiling? Well, if you put like a pen inside your mouth and smile and hold it there, it can change the way that you feel. And you know, giving yourself a hug for 20 seconds a day 
can change your energy. And these are all very research-based things, although they sound very simplistic. One, two other things I want to say. I want to say that being less hard on ourselves is huge because we, you know, we, we judge our, the way we are grieving too. We shouldn't be doing this and we should be doing that. We really shouldn't shit on ourselves. So we should be exercising more. You know, we judge our own grief journey and not judging it and just saying, you know what, I'm doing the best I can right now will help us to feel better instead of always criticizing ourselves. And the other thing I want to say, my mom has said this before, the, one of the issues of with exercising and taking care of yourself is the guilt that comes along with it. Mm -hmm. I should not, in other words, the messages we give ourselves, I should not be exercising or taking care of myself because it would be disloyal to Scott. Or people and would mom, think that I didn't care enough. Exactly. Yeah. Well, here's a piece of advice somebody sent us, of advice for physical health. My mom joined a gym, and in between jobs, she gets 20 minutes in on the treadmill or more time with instruction from a trainer. My twin brother started going back to the gym, too. So that's great. I love it. That. And then somebody else says, in taking care of themselves, I started a grief support in our area because there was nothing to help grieving families. This is what my son would have wanted. So that reaching out and doing things. And then another person says, uh, regarding the food we commented on, one thing that connects all of us is food. What was your beloved deceased favorite food? Maybe you have a recipe. Let us join together for their favorite meal. I thought that is really sweet from uh, Clark Robin. Like well, that. what a great show this has been and, and talking today. And uh, let's talk about a little bit about this last si slide. People grieve differently in their own time, right, Mary? Yeah, and I, I think um, the first year is the most difficult, and there's no way around it. You just have to work through it. Uh, you have to be, um, you know, easy on yourself. Uh, you have to surround yourself with with people that are supportive. Uh, you have to take into consideration what would that person that died want. And, and I know in talking to some of the 9-11 families, it was really consistent where they said, try not to let grief get the best of you. Find something positive to do in memory of your loved one. And um, it changes over time. I, I guarantee you that it will be different for you next year than it is this year. And I, I can say, um, in some ways, uh, I, I've grown as an individual. I've, I've been so fortunate to have wonderful friends and to have a wonderful family but also people that were perfect strangers on 9-11, you know, have become part of my life, and they're continuing to come forward even today. Uh, we just had our Christmas party for our organization at our home um, last night, and the trees were decorated, and I, I did decorate them <laughs> with a lot of Frank's help, but he's taken on more responsibility that he, he didn't have before 9-11. So you will find that you'll have new traditions, and certainly Brad is always in our mind and always in our hearts. In fact, we were going through pictures um, the other day, which you know I couldn't have done. I, I couldn't have gone through those pictures 14 right. years ago. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, your family is going to change. We ha now have a. A, a daughter, uh, our son Wes is married, and we have a daughter-in-law and two grandchildren, and so they give you new hope and and new meaning to uh, new traditions that you'll have in your own family. We just have uh, one more um, very heartfelt uh, blog that I want to connect to. Um, this lady is talking about the fact that she's trying to bring up her daughter and get holidays together, but she's not finding that people really want to respond to her, and she doesn't feel like people really care. It's you know been a while, and I want to say to people who are feeling that way, you do need to reach out for other communities. Mary's talking about the 9/11 community. I want to say that Compassionate Friends has 700 chapters in the United States. And there are people who care about you, who understand your problems, who will work with you. If, like me, you, it was a, a son was killed in an accident, we didn't have a whole support community. There is support out there. You can check with your local hospice, and they may have support for you. And, and there are support groups, and there are caring groups that um, care. But sometimes you do need to reach out. You maybe cannot expect 
your family to respond the way you want them to. Go on to our opentohope.com and if you're grieving at 2, 3, 4 in the morning, listen to shows like this one and you know, watch our cable shows, listen to our radio shows, listen to other people like us who have been there and made it because you will too and lean on our hope, my mom always says, till you found your own. Absolutely. We have over 500 radio shows for you. You can um, everything's tagged for content so that you can find your specific loss, an automobile accident or a parent or a spouse. Uh, we have all sorts of different things that you can link into to hear shows and we want to thank you so much and thank you Mary for uh, being on this webinar and Heidi it's, it's been great.